Hey everyone, find me back here, and I'm once again. Now, I decided to tackle Rocket Ronnie's latest attempt to debunk or, or get through his entire intelligent design. Now, despite what Rocket Ronnie says, I am a true Christian, you know, I'm not a fake Christian, whatever that means. Actually, I had a discussion yesterday on Alexi Bottom's hangout with Shamus, Shamus, I will say Shamus, uh, to, about my relationship with Christ. Now, I mean, I will be probably doing a hangout or maybe a video about this later down the line. But I want to tackle this first because honesty is something that I treasure above all things. And frankly, you're going to see why in a minute. Now, the true parasitism, this, hopefully you will respond to this instead of just, you know, not responding to me. Again, I'm going to give you cogent points of why we should not take Michael Behe seriously, but I'll let him go. Today we have on the show with us a very special guest. Many of our listeners are familiar with him. His name is Michael Behe. He's a professor of biochemistry at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. He's the notorious author of leading ID books such as Darwin's Black Box and The Edge of Evolution. And he's also recently the author of a paper in the journal Quarterly Review of Biology titled Experimental Evolution, Loss of Function Mutations, and the First Rule of Adaptive Evolution. And we have Dr. Behe on the now. With Michael Behe, we are de dealing with somebody who is, well, who is, it, is has, under oath, said that if if intelligent design was classified as science, then astrology would be classified as science as well. The, he said this under oath. And now the thing is, is that we have, we, we have his word that this is true. That again, and this is the reason why ID is not... Now again, you see it's been peer reviewed. Where was it peer reviewed? Now, on on the video you said it's peer reviewed in quarter review of biology. Now, whereabouts in again what whereabouts was it peer reviewed? Was it Scientific American? Was it peer reviewed in you know some sort of science journal? Where whereabouts was it peer reviewed? And I'm not asking this to be a jerk. I'm not asking this because. You know, I think I'm smarter than you. I just want to know so I can look this up for my own thing. I, I give it to people who are biologists to see what they think. Anyway, go ahead. Show with us today to talk about his new peer-reviewed paper in Quarterly Review of Biology. So, Dr. Behe, thank you so much for coming on the show with us. Uh, thanks a lot. Well, Dr. Behe, I am very excited about your paper. It's a peer-reviewed scientific paper in the journal Quarterly Review of Biology. Obviously, the type of paper that our critics say is not supposed to exist. And I was wondering if you could briefly just give us an overview of what your new paper is about. Yes, for the past 40 years, um, scientists have been very interested in trying to do evolution experiments in their laboratory. That is to, to see under controlled conditions uh, how organisms can change. And already, this is this raised some alarm bells. Evolution, just, all that evolution is, is a change of allele types over, in, in a species over a specific time. That's what evolution is. That's what the scientific theory of evolution is. There's nothing about changing types. There's nothing about changing times. What he's talking about there is common descent, uh, or as it, the theory of common descent, or the... the you know, the, the common parlance of evolution. He is not talking about the scientific theory of evolution, which has to do with the allele types. Now, the change to one animal to another is something that they are looking into, because they want to know how one animal evolved into another. And they have been studying this for years. It's not something that's just been done recently. So Michael Behe is already on the course to be, you know, not selling the exact truth here. But again, we'll, we'll get to the point that this could be just a general error, error on his part and he could just be misspeaking. We all do this, we all make errors, and we all have to give people a certain amount of leeway. But let's see how it goes. And they can do that with microorganisms like bacteria and viruses because they're very small and they reproduce rapidly and they reproduce in, in very large numbers. Uh, so they can really follow what changes there are in the bacteria. And my paper reviews all of that material and shows that a lot of bacteria and viruses improved in many experiments, but in general, 
they improved by deleting material they already had, by throwing away genetic information to make uh, things that were useful to them. And for some some reasons, that help. It's kind of like throwing away uh, if you're in a Yes, that's already a scientific theory. It's, all, it's called adaptation. That that, that 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 thing will evolve or adapt to its environment. And there's something that that they have that that again is no longer needed. Let's say, for example, it has a specific part of its genome that is not no no longer needed. But it will shed that. It will evolve to no longer have that. So it, it is now more efficient in the job it is doing. That this is evolution, Michael. This is what evolution is. It's adaptation to to one's environment. And if something is no more needed, then it is it disposes of it. It has no longer do. If there's a, a environmental or pre, uh, pressure for it no longer to exist, or for then then again that is half. Again, this whole idea of what well, needs if, to get rid of information is baloney because again it isn't old. Inf- it isn't getting rid of information. It's called new information, which overtakes the old one, which which is again deleting, which is again. Fusing or getting rid of the the information that was already there and for the with new ones, so it isn't losing data; it is just growing new ones or, and adapting more effectively to its environment. Roadboat that's sinking, throw away uh, a heavy computer or something that's weighing you down. So uh, we have seen uh, uh, in control experiments that evolution works, Darwinian evolution works, but it seems to degrade organisms more than build them up. Well, Dr. Behe, of course, in your paper, you talk about gain of function and loss of function mutations at the molecular level in what you call functional coding elements. Can you explain to our listeners what is a functional coding element, or an FCT as you call them? Well, yes. I, uh, everybody has heard, I think, of the genetic code and that DNA carries coded information. And, and it's really true. It's, it's like the Morse code, you know, where dash, dash, dot means a letter or something. And the same thing with the units called nucleotides of DNA. When you have certain ones in a row, they carry an actual meaning. No, they do not have a meaning. They, they, were, they were given a meaning. The reason that we put letters and whatever it is to understand it is so we can build, understand the building blocks of life. It doesn't mean that they have innately a, a meaning. It means that we have given them such. Again, if if it had a meaning, as you put it, then, then again, the, the, uh, the type should be similar across all animals. And that's what we do indeed find. Dear me, man. And there's lots of different codes in the DNA, not only codes that are for structural things called proteins, but there are what are called regulatory codes too, things that tell a gene when to turn on and turn off and how much to increase and whether to put an extra group on a protein or or not. And the uh, genome is, is just chock full of these functional coded elements. So I surveyed the papers that had done experimental evolution in the laboratory and see if any of them had ever reported that a new functional coded element uh, was produced. Okay, the coded element you're looking for does not happen over the lifespan of a single human being. It happens over many, 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 many lifespans because it takes thousands of years for a specific uh, type to happen. Now, there was a thing recently where they did find, I think it was a different type of frog in France. Apparently, it's a smaller type of frog, uh, which proves that evolution does happen and that it, it happened in France. It created this new type of frog. So, again, we have seen this in the real world and have real world effects. So saying that you know we haven't seen this is below, is wrong. Again, we have seen it happen. And again, the answer is, in one or two cases, yes. But it was generally the case that the investigator had removed that element and the system kind of replaced it. Uh, but for the overwhelming number of papers, no functional coded element uh, was produced completely new, that wasn't there before, that did something interesting or something different. So uh, so it seems to be a big evolutionary difficulty to make these positive elements, functional coded elements.
So, Dr. Behe, what do you mean by gain or loss of function? Well, heck, uh, Darwin himself, Charles Darwin, proposed the theory of evolution, but he knew that organisms could adapt or could fit themselves better into their environment, either by getting some new feature or losing an old one. For example, there are fish that live in caves in the dark, and they have lost vision. They have lost... Yes, he was proposed by Charles Darwin, but Charles Darwin was the person who came up with it. It was just what he, he was the one who credited it, who found the, 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 the theory that was... But there are people like Lamarck, Lamarck and a lot of other people who came up with similar theories that didn't quite learn the evidence, but were in, but were in the right role that were pushing Darwin in the role that would eventually lead him to finding about evolutionary theory. What, what, what you all think, Don Michael, again, is erroneous because, again, losing, losing information or, or whatever that means is, is just a loss of a extremity that is no longer viable in that particular species because they've evolved past it. Now, again, you say that we haven't found positive ones, but we've got tons of things that, again, have everyone's really beneficial things that we can list, like, for example, opposable thumbs. Uh, the, the fact we can breathe air is an evolutionary positive. The fact that we can walk on two legs is an evolutionary positive. The fact that we don't have to swing through trees is an evolutionary positive. Again, just because you think that everything that comes, that we lose information, does that mean we do ones just because we can't see it yet? Again, we, the, the whole fossil record and the human record of evolutionary processes is chock full of positivity positive things that uh, that have happened, uh, or things gaining the information as you want to put it. Just because you don't see it that way doesn't mean it isn't the case. ...their vision and much of their eyes, and it, it seems that uh, because their eyes are of no use to them, they have deteriorated so that they are pretty much non-functional. So they have adapted to their environment by losing something, losing a function. Uh, suppose you were in a boat, a rowboat or something, and it started to sink. It was leaky. And in your rowboat, you had a couple of big packages. One big package contained a sophisticated computer. One way you could help yourself uh, survive is by getting rid of the heavy but functional piece of equipment, a computer. So uh, since evolution is random, it will adapt an organism by either losing something it's already got or by gaining something that... As Kevin Miller explained to you in the Double Trail, evolution is not random. It is a process where things get selected and evolve to to be different based upon social and social uh, environmental and social pressures based upon it. So if, let's say, for example, it's been hung by a, a lion, as long as I'm quicker than the thing that the the other thing that the lion is hunting, then I'm going to be more successful in the environment I am in. That is, there's nothing random about it. It's all about survival. You know, uh, can we survive against, uh, against the things that, that is trying to attack us? If we can, then we're going to pass on our genes, and the thing that our genes are going to get more better at doing the thing that, that helps us survive. And the thing that, that runs even faster against the uh, lion, or the tiger, or whoever, is going to get even faster. That's the way it works. There's nothing random about this. You know, it is a process where you know survival wins. You know, adaptation wins. That's the thing. And as Ken Ken Miller explained to you, that is what evolution is stating. What you're saying is a cheat and total straw man. It doesn't have. And so I wanted to go back and look at these experiments to see if there was a predominant mode of evolution. You then, of course, go on to review a number of studies of molecular evolution and whether or not they involved gain or loss of function at the molecular level involving an FCT. What was your finding? Do examples of adaptive evolution at the molecular level tend to involve gain or loss of an FCT? Well, I was surprised the overwhelming number of adaptive mutations, that is, mutations that help the organism, are either loss of function or, at best, what I call modification of function, that is, where a pre-existing function is kind of changed a tiny bit. But most of the mutations were loss of function ones where 
an old function was destroyed or the modification function where a pre-existing function was tweaked a little bit, but it was not either made uh, anew or destroyed. But again, that, that, that's very nebulous because again, if something's modified, then it's a new function. And if it gains another I don't know, blood vent, a new a new blood vessel or a new a new finger or something like that, it had fingers before, but it's a new one to help adapt to its environment more. So that would be an evolutionary process. That is it gaining information, as you were, gaining a new anatomical feature, gaining something that it didn't have before. Again, this this is a very um, poor understanding of of biological biological function. It was very rare. There were only a few cases where there was what I would call a gain of function. In your paper, you reviewed work on both bacteria and viruses. Did you find anything different between bacteria and viruses in the sort of evolutionary adaptations that they undergo at the molecular level? Yes, bacteria and viruses are a bit different, but not all that different, uh, in that both viruses and bacteria mostly adapt by loss or modification of function, and it's rare that they gain a function. But viruses, it turns out, uh, have gained functions more often than bacteria. But Now, I'm not, I'm not to educated enough to speak of bacterial evolution, but I'm going to say that's bullshit. Um, but I'm going to contact Fiona. She studied bacterial evolution, uh, and I'm sure that she wouldn't be willing to like you know, answer that, but I'm going to pretty sure call nonsense on that because I'm sure that there are all bacteria do gain in something like, for example, uh, the fact that bacteria can can develop to, to uh, attack new things. Like, for example, if, if it is now full of yeast, it can again attack yeast in, in the same way it attacks everything else. Now, again, Michael B. has been very disingenuous here. I again. I'm not, I'm not going to speak on bacterial evolution, I don't know about it, but again, I'm going to say no, but I'm going to wait for Fiona or Sam or somebody like that who knows about this to talk about it down below. As I do, it'll be down below, please. Please have a look. Oh, if you know about it, please post it. Uh, I'd love to see it. Only under special circumstances. In some of the experiments I reviewed, investigators deliberately took out a functioning piece of the virus's DNA and then wanted to see how it might evolve to compensate for that missing piece. And in some circumstances, if it was small enough, the viruses were able to re-evolve that same piece or something very similar to it. So that that was a gain of function. But interestingly, it was just a, a gain of a function that had already been there. It was not a, you know, a brand new function. What about the work of Richard Lensky, Dr. Behe? Do you review Lensky's work in your paper, and does it show that your arguments about the edge of evolution are refuted, as some have claimed? Well, uh, I greatly... Now, Richard, uh, now Lensky has indeed debunked this idea of like, a loss of information, but again, Michael B. He will not see it that way, because it, it's not just Richard Lensky that has done so, it was Ken Miller and a lot of other people who were toxic ID, people like Francis Elia, people like that, who people who are not just atheists, people who are Christian as well, have developed this idea, because again, it isn't scientific. To quote Camilla, uh, intelligence ID is neither science nor religion, so it belongs in either. In my reality, he's done the biggest experimental evolution experiments for the past 20 years. He's been growing a bacterium called E. coli in his laboratory at Michigan State and just watching how it changes over time, watching how it evolves. And over the course of several decades, he's published quite a bit about his experiment. And of course, uh, going back and reviewing, I spent a lot of time on his work. And he, too, has reported that a number of mutations in the E. coli that he is evolving helped it grow in his laboratory. They were adaptive, beneficial mutations. But when he went to determine exactly what the mutations were, many of them were loss of function mutations, and some of them were also modification of function. Now, I've never looked at Richard Lebsky's work... Uh, but I'm going to guess that isn't what he said. I, I, I don't know. I'm just going to say I'm going to say because 
you know, my, of what I know about B he and his, and his propensity to twist the truth of what it is, it probably isn't. Now, uh, I'm going to post down below, if I find it, uh, Richard Davis's work. If I'm not managed to find it, if you could, if anybody else could find it, or knows where it is, please post the link, I will not get it, I'll, I'll put it down below so people can have a look at it. But I'm pretty sure Richard Lemsey doesn't say that, but let's carry on. In other words, the bacteria were improving themselves by throwing away things that were no longer of use to them. Uh, again, in his particular experiments, he did not see any gain of function mutation. So the biggest evolutionary experiment in the history of the world, essentially, a gain of function mutation was not seen. So Dr. Behe, what is a general overarching principle that we can take from your paper? And in fact, you close with what you call the first rule of adaptive evolution. What is that, and can you explain it, and what its implications are for us? Yeah, I kind of try to summarize the reviewed results in what I dubbed the first rule of adaptive evolution. And the rule is this, break or blunt any functional coded element whose loss would yield a net fitness gain. Cells are composed of many genetic components, and it's oftentimes adaptive to the cell, helpful to the cell, to get rid of one or more of them. And in the examples I reviewed from the past 40 years, it seems that the easiest and quickest way for a cell to adapt is to simply get rid of something, and that oftentimes will help. And this is, I think, a very important, very important take-home lesson that, at least in the short term, cells and probably uh, animals and plants as well will adapt to their environment by breaking things that they already have because it's faster and because they have so many functional parts that breaking one of them will likely have a positive result. I guess for someone who is not in the thick of this scientific debate, what is the takeaway point that you would give them? Well, it's, it's this. The take-home message is that the adaptive evolution we see around us, uh, such as antibiotic resistance or the adaptation in laboratory experiments, is not the kind of process that we need to explain how life got built up in the first place. Loss of function, even modification of function, helps an organism by essentially degrading it. Now this is untrue, because as we can see from the recorded history of Ebola, for example, that it actually gained stuff to be able to attack our species better. Now we have history of this, Michael. And indeed true empiricism, we have history of this. This, this is thing we can look up. We have a history of this of this of this this thing trying to attack us. And the way it's better it's better involved in, it hasn't lost things, it's trying to gain things to be able to attack us. Now I may have lost certain things in order to attack us better, but maybe gain things as well. Again, you can't just say it's all negative here. Because again, you see you, this seems to be a very bad way of, of looking at biology in general. Again, I'm very interested to see this uh, peer review paper, so true personalism, please produce it. I mean, I'd love to read this. If someone else could produce it down below, I'd love to read this. Because I'm sure that people like Sam and Fiona and people who are actual scientists would love to go through this, because blimey Charlie. By feeding off of the complexity it already has. Many organisms, the ones I reviewed in the article, Organisms that develop antibiotic resistance and so on do so by degrading the complexity that they already have, kind of feeding off of that. But what we need to explain is how organisms got there in the first place. How did complex systems, how did gain of function uh, mutations uh, arise over time? And from what I was able to review, it seems like that might be a considerably different process than the adaptive process we see in our world. Well, that's really fascinating, Dr. Behe. And, you know, as I read your paper, I couldn't help but think that if you have a process of adaptive evolution, which by and large tends to remove or slightly modify functional coding elements rather than produce new ones, then if you sort of look at the background rate of gain versus loss of these FCTs, 
it seems to me that over time, eventually an organism is going to have net losses of these functional coding elements until perhaps there's nothing left to lose. <laughs> and if this is the direction that adaptive Darwinian evolution is pushing biological organisms at the molecular level, it doesn't seem like it's a sustainable process by which they ultimately can evolve new or more complex biological systems. Is, is this thinking at all on the right track? Well, uh, yes, yes. Maybe we could call this Cheshire cat evolution, you know, that over time everything disappears except the smile. If you are losing function elements, if a species is over long periods of time, then there's got to be a way to put them back in uh, or to have gotten them there in the first place, or essentially the genome will degrade into a very simple one, maybe even a simple one that can't support itself anymore. So we know now that adaptive evolution, the good evolution, the kind that helps organisms, still isn't enough to explain how the complexity of life got here. I'd say, man, because that's where you're wrong. It is enough, because, again... If we can see animals adapting to their environment, which we see all the time in nature, then that does explain that you know that that things over you know a, a, a specific length of time can adapt to their environment and will begin to physically change to be able to better adapt to its environment. We have seen this. We do see it now. Uh, we we see speciation. We see development. We see adaptation. And again, the the idea that we just lose things. No things. Again, things will change, your know, paws will change, you know, legs will change, you know, t beings will change to better suit the environment they're in. That is the whole point. We need not only something that can help, but something that can construct, and we don't see that in, in the examples that I looked into. Finally, Dr. Behe, is there anything that you'd like to say about the publication process as you publish this paper? Uh, yes, I would. I, I would like to say that I had a very positive experience with the journal Quarterly Review of Biology and was treated uh, with professional respect at every stage of the process. I sent in a manuscript initially, and it was reviewed and sent back, and they decided that as it was written, it was not in good enough shape to publish, but they said that if I could answer their criticisms of the reviewers and whip it back into shape, then they would reconsider it. And, and I did that. I looked very carefully at the criticisms. I tried to address all of them and sent it back in, and they at that point decided that I had successfully met the criticisms of the reviewers. Does the paper that, that, that you actually finally published have any resemblance to the things that you've been inserting now? If not, then you're being very dishonest and disingenuous here. Because again, if they were pointing out the errors that I've been pointing out, and then you changed it and you were actually making a cogent and that you could hear a point, maybe... Then again, I'd love to see an unaltered version of these, this paper than an altered version, because then we could actually get a better point of what was changed and how. Uh, so I have to say that uh, I recommend <laughs> recommend the quarterly review highly as a very professionally run uh, organization where the editors uh, do their job seriously and well. Well, that's great news, Dr. Behe. And again, congratulations on the publication of your paper, Experimental Evolution, Loss of Function Mutations, and the First Rule of Adaptive Evolution. Uh, I hope that you don't lose any function today and have a great <laughs> week, and we really appreciate you being on the show with us. Well, that's the end of that. Now, if I do manage to get hold of paper, I will try and get hold of people to try and review this damn thing. Um, I mean, I'll try and get hold of Jane, I'll try and get hold of Fiona. We'll, we'll try and do a hang-up, if we're not on this channel, then another channel of this paper. Because I'm sure that they would love to go through it and see what it, it actually does say. I'm sure that it bears no relation to what Michael B. B. He do, is claiming it says. Now, for for those... Uh, and I'll, you know, Ronnie, this this paper probably doesn't say what he's claiming, and the thing, the reason we're saying that is because science overall does not agree with him. Now he may have changed it so it doesn't say exactly what he's claiming. It may say something very different, but maybe he, what he's saying here is not representative of what was in the actual article itself. Now the thing is, is that if you actually produced the article itself, we could actually discuss that, but you haven't. Now the thing is, is that. Michael Behe, under oath, said these said exactly what I just said. Now, 
Um, I'm, I'm always having this question with you, but again, the whole, the, the whole idea about fake Christians, you know what, you know what a fake Christian is, is somebody who is given information that conflicts with you and he doesn't take it on board. Because there's, there's, there's a quote from Jesus that I love, which is, you should answer every question that is asked of you, as honestly as you can. And if someone doesn't accept the answer, that's fine. But again, answer me this. Have you actually read the article? And if so, does it bear any relation to what he is proposing? Now, if you, it does, then that is something that we have to discuss. Do you not agree? Anyway, this has been 5BXC, 4Dreams, make a troop, out.